Hello, it's been a while since I've made a video, so I decided I'd make one. Apologies for the audio quality, I don't have the proper mic here. But before we actually get into this video by Jacqueline Glenn, I want to make it very clear that I don't actually agree with either side in this. I think they're both rather silly, but I think that will become evident as we go forward with the video. So anyway, let's, let's go into this. Let's go into this actual response video that I'm actually making for the first time in years. Hey guys, it's time for guess what? Another video on Girl Defined. And I decided that now I'm gonna wait until marriage, and we'll talk about that later. Yeah, damn right guys, I'm fucking going there. I'm gonna fucking go there. I was raised very religious, and not only was I religious, I was raised Catholic, and with that comes a lot of guilt. Guilt about doing anything at all. That's fine. I suppose I should make my background rather clear as well. I was raised very secular, and over the last few years I've done a lot of reading into religion and i found myself to, in fact, Roman Catholicism. And I have to disagree with the fact that it shames you for doing these things which are supposedly healthy, but we'll get into that. So I grew up with the idea and this feeling that anything sexually related is shameful and you should be, like, afraid of your own body kind of thing, which is a really harmful way to grow up. And that brings me to Girl Defined. Let's go. First of all, I apologize, but I don't think that you're in any position to judge what is damaging and what isn't. I think that there are far more educated people to judge that are out there to judge that than you or I. Now, what I will say is that with my self-education of Catholic teaching, I don't think that it is particularly hard on sex. I think it treats it in its proper way, but I think my views and ultimately what views are very close to Catholicism, I like to think, will become very evident throughout the video because the video goes into, as you'd probably expect, that kind of territory and it's far better to explain it organically. Oh, first video that someone tweeted at me was this. Thank you so much, Laura. Please revisit the gold mine that is girl defined. Why I waited until marriage to kiss. Huh. This is gonna be good. And today, we are going to be talking about why I saved my first kiss for marriage. I actually, yes, I have not kissed Dave. We are saving our first kiss for when we are husband and wife. Imagine your first kiss ever being in front of your family and friends. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but that sounds horrible. I actually agree with Jacqueline here. I think it's absolutely absurd to take it to that level. And I'm, I mean, I'm very, very, at least I try to be a good husband. I just think that maybe the reasons that these two women have are perhaps ordered, but I do think it is a bit far. And I'd like to think that other people here will agree with me, but I'm sure I'll have a lot of people in the comments telling me, no, you're wrong. I did not expect this road to last as long as it 30 has. 30 years? So 30 years? Was that a little passive aggressive? Like, <laughs> it took you 30 years to find a man to marry you. 30 has. years? So when I decided like, hey, that would be a cool idea. And then, you know, each year like, I, yeah, this is a cool idea, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's actually really stupid. I think it's really cool that you and Dave are doing that. And you do get a lot of questions about that. And I know I got a lot of questions about it because Zach and I did the same thing. And now we've been married for seven years. And so we have literally been enjoying kissing and having so much fun, intimacy-wise. We've literally been having so much fun. So much fun, just like kissing and intimacy-wising things. Because I can't say the word sex because, you know, that's embarrassing and shameful. Feel shame. Honestly, I think that's just a prop thing. That whole inability to say the word sex. So I don't think it's a general criticism of Christianity, and generally. Because, I mean, I have no problem saying that shit, but then again... Most of you geezers who are watching probably know that. I don't really hold back when I'm talking. So, I'm just going to put this down to the fact that there are a bunch of um, low church Protestants who take the purity stuff far too seriously while they completely ignore any sort of theology. So, hey, you know, I never said I was going to agree with everything that, that these girls say, and I'm certainly not going to agree with everything Jacqueline says. Kissing and having so much fun, intimacy-wise. Just say sex! Just say having sex. For over seven years, it has been awesome. But before I was married, I remember really thinking through and processing yeah. this. And Zach and I even had some conversations like, are we going to kiss? Are we not going to kiss? And I'm sorry, this just seems really stupid for two adults. Like, what, what are these girls? Like, late 20s? And they're sitting around with 
their significant other being like, I don't know, like, should we kiss? Like, oh, that's so crazy. I think there is something to be said for prudence. Like, like one thing can lead to another, and these people obviously have a moral code to follow when it comes to that. So can you really blame them? Like, I've found myself in situations where I've had a bird sitting on my bed, and I've been like, do I do anything? For that exact reason? <laughs> I, I think it would be unreasonable to think that these people didn't have that, but, that, I mean, they took it to an even greater degree than me. Like, I've never had problems with solving birds, but... I can't, like, I, I honestly can't feel, I honestly can't judge these people for doing that. It may seem a little prudish compared to, uh, well, the less said about Jacqueline in that regard, the better. But you know what I'm saying. You see what I mean? I, I can't really judge these people. I think they're totally fine for that. And then on that wedding day and beyond, like, just have at it and have so much fun. Just go at it. Yeah. Patience and really wanting to get to know me and my personality and who I am. Not just your keep, body. <laughs> not just my body, wanting to keep Christ at the center. Yeah, girl, I bet you wanted to keep Christ at the center. Uh, on a serious note, I really don't like this because they're, they're kind of implying that if you do have sex in a relationship, that the meaningfulness of it isn't there, that you can't also have uh, you know, a connection with someone that's mental, that, that goes beyond the physical. And I think you've got to ask backwards, Jacqueline. I think, obviously, you can have that intimate, like, a level of intimacy within a relationship, obviously. Otherwise, I don't see how marriages could actually stay together. And I think that these women obviously did have a level of intimacy with the guy they're with. But it doesn't have to be sexual. And the reason why the Abrahamic religions restrict sex until marriage aside from obviously the theological justification I'm purely looking at it from a practical perspective is that it stokes the eros and you don't want to play with eros now what is eros the erotic love it's a powerful beast like every guy knows it, every woman knows it that powerful driving illogical force and when you involve something like sex that is the ultimate manifestation of that. It can be exceptionally powerful. Now, for the moment, it sounds like something like, I don't know, fucking Ariana Grande would sing about or some shit. But why is it a bad thing to let this beast go? Well, because it fucks up lives. It fucks up lives really badly. You won't, you probably, everyone watching this, know at least, at least one person. If you know, you almost certainly know more than that. I know more than that who have had their w lives turned upside down and fucked up by this. Numerous plays are written about it. Like, for example, Romeo and Juliet. That's not some sort of lovey-dovey story that you take your bird to and it makes a nice night. In abstract, what Shakespeare was warning about was this Eros. It leads to the main character's dying for a stupid fucking reason and that's exactly why you keep the sex until marriage because at least when you're within marriage there's like a hardened sacramental element to it there is the combination of the two two flesh you know the manifestation of the flesh into one right so that eros is somewhat tamed outside of that you can i mean you, you've had breakups jacqueline you'll know what it's like and that's a destructive thing. Like, if you have too many breakups, it permanently fucks people up. So if you do it within marriage, there's less of a risk of that. Because marriage is, at least in Catholicism, maybe not so much in Eastern Orthodoxy or in Protestant denominations, it's a very, very hard institution which is very hard to demolish for that exact reason. You, you hurt people through having Eros run rampant through a society and you can actually see the influence of like Eros not being caged on the productivity and prosperity of the society. If you haven't heard of him you should probably go and read Sex and Culture by J.D. Unwin. He actually studies nearly a hundred different civilization and civilizations and cultures and links their prosperity to how controlled this Eros is. I'll try and find and link a copy of it in the description. You don't need to read the entire book because it's very long. Mostly it's case studies. 
but you only really need to read the first hundred odd pages to get an idea of what Mr. Unwin is getting at, or Dr. Unwin, I should probably say. As though physical intimacy invalidates the meaningfulness of your relationship, which I actually think it's the opposite. Like, I can't imagine fully falling in love with someone or fully connecting with someone without that. I feel like it's as important as a mental connection. You have to have mental and physical, otherwise you're just friends. Like, I'll be honest, this isn't an argument, but I do think that that is very sad. I couldn't imagine living like that, not being able to love somebody purely because I hadn't fucked them. And how do you not figure that out until marriage? How bad would it suck to marry someone and then realize that there's no physical chemistry? I mean, this is why marriages end all of the time. I think it'd be smart to figure that out before you get married. If you honestly think that the reason why we have a third to a half of all marriages breaking down now, as opposed to, say, 200 years ago where the level was far less, I think that you are legitimately retarded. I think the major reason, and I think this is very obvious from anybody who interacts with people who are married, I think the main reason why they break up, is partic particularly in, in secular society, is that the institution isn't taken seriously, first of all, and second of all, people don't know how to deal with the stress. And it and while, obviously, you will stop having sex or something like that breaks up, I think the more important thing is, like, money issues, emotional issues, you know, things which aren't directly connected to that. And besides, these women you're talking to, uh, and talking about, they aren't going to do anybody besides their husbands, if they are, like, not bullshitting. So, how are they going to know the distinction between good and bad sex? Like, like really, like... How are they going to be able to put two and two together like that? They ain't, are they? Because they ain't going to know any different. This is really terrible advice. This is terrible advice. To be honest, it's not as hard as it seems. Yeah. It's very but freeing, I've heard you say. Yes, it's very freeing because you're not like always like, oh, did we go too far? Did we do this? Like, right. we're free. Or you could just feel free to go ahead and do all of those things because that's what people do when they're trying to figure out if someone's a suitable partner. Avoiding something entirely isn't freeing you from that thing. You're just running from it. Yes, just let the Eros, you know, run rampant. You know, just, just let it happen. I, this couldn't possibly be connected to the fact that women are less happy than they were 70 years ago or anything. Or the rising suicide rates or anything like that. No, it couldn't possibly be connected to that at all, could it? Like I said at the beginning of this video, if you can go about things in a healthy and smart way, then there is something very freeing about that, and you can really truly connect with someone on a deeper level. I mean, there's chemistry behind this, guys. There's pheromones, there's all different kinds of ways that your brain chemistry changes after you physically connect with a person, and it makes you fall more in love with them. And yes, there's a difference between love and infatuation, and we will get to that later, but I do think that it is a really, really integral part of fully connecting with someone. So, in light of what you've actually just said there, don't you think it would actually make more sense to control it? I mean, you can be infatuated more through sex, yeah, you're right. But what about if someone doesn't feel the same way and then you're like, just cut, you know? Just whack and it's over. How do you think the other person's going to feel? And I know for a fact that you felt that. So, you don't think it might make a little bit more sense that we control it in a certain way, perhaps with an institution, and then you know, prevent the fact that this, uh, this love doesn't die in such a brutal, gruesome and unpleasant way. Be willing to be radical because there are other Christian young men out there who are willing to do the same. Whoa! That is one of the most ridiculous, I mean, and I've made videos on them, but this right here is one of the most ridiculous quotes I've ever heard. Be willing to be radical. We're, we're, you know, advocating for radicalism right now. Be willing to be radical because there's other guys out there that'll do the same thing with you. Great. Well, I suppose when you live in a society where the majority of people do not do that, it might actually be a radical act. <laughs> I mean, you, you giggle at it as if like, no, 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 you Christians, you're not supposed to be the radicals. I'm the radical. But in reality, you're actually more of a status quo humper 
than these women here. As much as I think these women are, in a lot of ways, fucking ridiculous, you are actually more in line with the orthodoxy than they are. And so they're right. They are actually being radical through doing this. And you're not. Ugh, so frustrating. All right, the next video that someone sent me here, what is it? We've got Can't Go Wrong with Good Old Girl Defying. Thank you so much. It's Dre, honey. I appreciate the video link. Reclaiming God's design for love, marriage, and sex. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. Just the title. Reclaiming God's design for love, marriage, and sex. Yeah, this is definitely going to be good. I can't wait to hear what they think. God has to say about love, marriage, and sex. Yes, we cannot wait to hear what these proles have to say in comparison to my enlightened coastal sexual ethics. All right, so the girl on the right is married. The girl on the left, at the time they recorded this, wasn't married, I'm assuming is, is still a virgin. I don't know, she could have done whatever, I don't know, but she's claiming to be a virgin, at least, on the internet, but she's making a video talking about sex advice, so that's great. God is actually the designer of love, marriage, and sex. So even despite sex? Pop, even <laughs> sex? Even sex? What's that? God is actually the good mm. designer of marriage, of love, and of sexual intimacy. Well, she doesn't know what it is, but she's interested because she was moaning throughout that explanation. Good mm. designer. Mm. <laughs> He's the one who brought these things into existence. Wow. wow, I didn't know that. The image of God, he created him what? Male and female. No, no, are we about ready to get homophobic? I feel like we're about ready to get homophobic. See, this is what I was talking about. We'll see, I'm not sure, we're not through the video yet, but I don't feel bad making fun of these girls because they're horrible. God created the male and female. I'm sorry, but um, I, I wouldn't. I would actually feel bad because they are human beings too, first of all, and second of all, I'm not recalling God or any or whoever created the universe actually making any sexes beyond male and female. Like, they've got intersex, but that's clearly just a, a fuck off on certain alleles, right? So, and also how can you get into like homophobia territory when you've mentioned just that there's man and woe man, you know? Like, it, do it does get into that territory later on, but you can't infer that based on just that statement. And to do that is actually illogical. So first we want to unpack love defined by God. Not love defined by the culture, not love defined by our personal opinion, but love defined by God. Yeah, this is definitely heading in a homophobic direction. Like, it's not what people think in society. It's not about the culture. It's about what God says, okay? I'm not the one that's homophobic. I'm just listening to God. It's not me. It's God. Well, you see, Jacqueline, this is how I can tell, in spite of wherever you may have come from, I don't think you really gave much thought to your faith. In fact, I think that you probably dropped it the first moment you could. And not because of supposed illogical parts of the religion. If you wanted to remedy those, you could have read any number of the other ones, but you didn't. And I can tell because you're unable to understand that when you're actually religious, you don't use God as some sort of thing you pray to just for things or as an emotional crutch. You actually view it as the source of all truth, as that unactualized actualizer. And when God is said to give you a covenant, you follow it. Now, if, I mean, first of all, and you mentioned this quite a lot later on as well, Christians should not hate gay people. In fact, it's actually mortally sinful to hate gay people. Because, as every other human being on earth, gays are made in the likeness and image of God. Saint Mother Teresa famously said that when asked on the gays, um, she responded, what you mean children of God? Yes, the trouble is, within at least Catholicism, I can't speak for Protestant denominations, because I know they can go a little bit nuts, and I think I'm pretty much speaking for Eastern Orthodoxy when I say this. The problem is, is that inclination goes against the sexual ethic of Christianity. But in no way that's different from, say, getting a blowjob. <laughs> that, that's the thing. I think that atheists, or at least ideologic, ideological atheists such as yourself, you like to major on this thing, yet you ignore the fact that it's just as bad as getting a BJ. And 
and like the, the reaction from a Christian isn't going to be any different unless it's like insane an insane frequency of Solomon. And so I, I think you can pretty much cut this shit out, although I know you won't because most of the time, love defined by ourselves or love defined by pop culture is based on really one thing. It's kind of based on feelings. <laughs> wow, my mind is blown. I never knew that love was based on feelings. Feelings and emotions. If you feel like you love someone, then you must mm -hmm. really love them. If you feel like you your feelings have left you and now you don't love this person, oh, you must not love them anymore. That is the dumbest shit I have ever heard. Yes, of course love is a feeling but it encompasses a lot more. Like that feeling will drive you to behave in a certain way and do certain things that are selfless for another person because you love them. We're not talking about like a TV show, like, oh my God, I love that TV show, but <laughs> the season was boring, don't love it anymore. We're talking about human interactions and emotions. That is not realistic. Yes, some people might behave that way and say that they love someone, but then act a different way. But in my opinion, that just means that they didn't really love that person. You have to follow it up with actions, otherwise it's meaningless. And this is why so many people in modern society are unhappy, including probably Jack because they've got it asked backwards. That's not how it works. It isn't just you feel this thing and therefore you do selfless acts. No, the selfless acts come first from one party or another because then there's no... without that there's no motivation to start anything. In the words of uh, soon to probably be saint, uh, but at the moment venerable, the venerable Fulton Sheen, love is a verb. You love something by acting on it. You don't just feel it. If it were, it would purely be a noun. Yet, the, language, the English language, and pretty much any other language I can think of, treats it as a verb. And the thing is, is that that attitude towards, well, you love someone and then you do the actions, is another reason why relationships are short-lived. Because the feeling will just go some days. You will not love someone, sometimes you'll fucking hate people. Like, there have been times where I've been with women where I've fucking fancied the pants off of them one day, and the next day I've been like, oh god, you. It's... <laughs> you, you see, that's why it has to be a verb. It has to be a constant action where you're acting on the other person. And I'm not saying... Obviously, I'm not saying necessarily in a physical way, in the way that I'm sure Jacqueline would like to interpret it. I mean, through those selfless acts or through just those ways of being. It's a very fickle type of love. It comes, it goes, and it's really unstable and uncertain. And honestly, that kind of love makes me feel very insecure. Of course it makes you feel insecure because it's not an actual type of love. You can't say that it's a type of love. You can't make that a category. That's shitty. Well, the Greeks certainly did. Because, okay, one one moment Kristen might feel like she loves me today. Oh, oh, great. But now, no, I, I upset her and now she doesn't love me anymore. Oh, great. I better watch out. This is just so fucking stupid. But it is kind of funny how the girl on the right is like, ah, that's true. Some days I don't love you. Oh, that's right. Love defined by God is not based on feelings, but rather on action. That's what I just said. And it's not about God. That's like the normal definition that almost anybody would give of love. You can't just say something and not follow it up with actions. I don't know anybody who would be like, yeah, it's fine to just feel it, but never do anything to prove it or never do anything that actually stands behind the words you say. Yeah, that's fine. Everyone knows you have to back that up with actions. And this is not defined by God. This is defined by logic. Sweetie, God is logic. Um... If you were actually a decent Catholic, you could just read the very entry to the Gospel of John and see that. En arche que logos. Defined by any normal person with an adult understanding of what love really means. God is the most incredible example of true yeah. love that we have in this world. <clears throat> this is what the Lord Almighty says. Now go and strike. 